I'm Julian Hyde. I'm going to be speaking about Morel, a functional query language today. Um, I'm going to post the slides at my Twitter account. So um, you don't need to take pictures of the screen. Uh, they'll, they'll be posted right after the presentation. So imagine that you need to index the web, or you have a million documents you would like to build a text index on. Um, so here are the files. And what you want to do is break them into individual words. Um, and for each particular word, you want to build an index that says, has, contains all the document IDs that contain that word. Or to simplify a little, maybe you just want to count the number of occurrences of the words in all those documents. So this is a classic problem, classic distributed systems problem. Um, and the distributed system that you want to build in order to do this efficiently is going to look something like this. So you want multiple workers that are each taking a set of documents, splitting them up into words, um, shuffling the words um, so that all, all occurrences of the words beginning with A go to a, the same reducer and all the words that begin with P go to another reducer. And then those reducers are going to write out the sorted index files. And if we simplify the problem a little bit, we end up with the, the well-known word count problem, where we're not actually storing the document IDs. We're just simply counting the number of occurrences of each word. So this problem, this, this problem word count, um, it first arose, as far as I know, in the MapReduce paper around 2005. Um, and it was arguing for this kind of distributed system and arguing for a particular programming model called MapReduce to solve it. Um, I'm bringing it up here because I, the problem we're interested in is data parallel programming. Um, parallel meaning that you are processing the same input, but you have multiple workers that are working on that input. Um, and it's... Uh, some people have called it embarrassingly parallel. In other words, the workers don't need to communicate with each other. As long as you are able to divide the work into partitions of data, each worker can work on a particular stream of data um, and not interfere with the other workers, which makes it you know, very, very scalable. Of course, the problem is to recognize um, the, those streams of data that uh, can be processed independently. So it's for solving batch processing problems, or perhaps incremental streaming problems. Um, the input is it's working on large immutable data sets. Um, and uh, one particular feature of this that drove you know, the uh, MapReduce model and things like Hadoop and Spark is that the, these jobs are so big that there's a significant chance of hard, some hardware failure dur failing during the execution. So in MapReduce, the way that they did this is they, surprisingly, I think, at the time it was very surprising, they, just, they turned to functional programming as a way of expressing this problem. And they said, let's suppose the system provides a function called MapReduce, and you, the programmer, supply it with, and MapReduce is a large, complex function. It's, in fact, a framework, right? Many thousands of lines of code. Um, and it's a distributed system. But you, the programmer, write two functions, a mapper function and a reducer function, which in the case of the word count problem, the mapper function is to take a uh, file or a line of, that contains multiple words and split it into the individual words. And you pair each word with a count, which is, which is one. Um, and then the reducer takes a list of words um, and a list, a list of words, all of which have the same key, and sums up the counts. Um, you put those together, really you're using the framework to glue together these two small functions you've written. You end up with a solution to your problem, and it's a solution that runs in a, you know, efficient, scalable, parallel framework. Um, that's fine if you're a C programmer or a 
Python programmer, but it's not so good if you're a SQL programmer. And, um, so, and you know, a lot of people looked at these systems and said, well, these are clearly, these are, it's kind of like a query. Can we do this in SQL? And the answer at the time was, no, you can't. Um, there's a couple of things that, that make this difficult to do in SQL. Um, one of which is that uh, SQL doesn't handle nested collections very well um, because it has this hard distinction between a table, which is something you can put in the from clause of your SQL statement, um, and a, an expression that you can put in the select clause or the where clause. So you have to use this, this word, the, these words lateral table to say, I want you to treat this expression split d.text treat it as a table expression, not a column expression. Um, and I think only really, really advanced SQL people know how to do this. And the other thing is, um, and, and in my view, that's just like an unnecessary feature of the SQL design to create two different kinds of expressions that can only occur in different places. Um, and the other is you need to use it to find function. And SQL, you can do use it to find functions, but you have to go to a different language, define it, add that user defined function to your class path, restart your engine, whatever. It's, you have to leave the SQL language in order to accomplish this. So I'm gonna be talking about a language called Morel, uh, which solves this problem in three lines. Um, I am presuming that you've, de you've de defined the split function elsewhere, but as we'll see, you can do it in a few lines in the same program. So, I've already given you the answer. I think the answer is morale. But what are the options here? You know, for a while I was looking at how do I extend SQL to have user-defined functions, um, to have functions as values, uh, improving the SQL type system so it has things like polymorphism. Um, oh yeah, let's write, if we're gonna do you know, general purpose computation in SQL, we're gonna to need to write an optimizing compiler for SQL that can do things like tail recursion and elimination, that kind of stuff. Or, and you know, since SQL is a 50-year-old language, that's rather a, it's rather, rather a tall order. The other thing, the other approach is, why don't we take an existing functional programming language and make relations a first-class object in those in that language, you know, build them into the language the same way that, let's say, floating point numbers are built into the language, which means making the language aware of the operations you can do on relations. I'm not just talking about adding it to the standard library, I'm talking about building it into the language. Um, we need a way to map external data into this. If we're gonna do database kinds of problems, we need a way to make this program aware of relations that are stored in, say, a MySQL database or that are stored in a distributed file system. Um, and then we write, need to write a query optimizer, not a, you know, the other kind of optimizer, the, 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 some that does the kind of optimizations that SQL optimizers do. If we do that, then we get all the nice stuff that's in modern functional programming, functional programming languages like algebraic types, pattern matching, and so forth. So a uh, quick straw poll so I get a feel of this audience. So who in the room has written any SQL in the last six months? All right. Who in this room has written uh, code in a functional programming language like Haskell or OCaml or standard ML in the last six months? Okay, okay. So I saw about 50% and now we're about 40% on that one. Uh, okay, that's good. I don't know whether these are two like competing factions or whether it's <laughs> the same people that raised their hands both times. Anyway, what I am trying to do is I am trying to bring all that functional goodness to the SQL users without making them run away in horror and go, I'm not using this, it has braces in it. Um, so that's my goal. Uh, let me cut to the chase here and just describe like in one, in one page what morale is. Um, so that we can cut through all of the, you know, marketing. Uh, I'm just gonna read this. Morel is a functional programming language. It is derived from standard ML and is extended with list comprehensions and other relational operators. Like standard ML, Morel has parametric and algebraic data types with Henley-Milner type inference. 
where L is implemented in Java and is optimized and executed using a combination of techniques from functional programming language compilers and database query optimizers. So if that makes sense to you, you can leave now. Um, so standard ML is a choice that I think needs to be justified. Um, so here's the kind of the family tree of functional programming languages with Lisp at the top. Um, ML started in 1973 and became standardized around 1983. And things like Haskell are, and, and OCaml are derived from it. Um, we've also got languages in the kind of the Lisp part of the family tree like Scheme and Clojure. Um, and then you've got these kind of hybrid languages like uh, Scala and uh, C-sharp, F-sharp, which have kind of mixed parentage of, uh, from functional languages and also from a declarative, uh, from procedural languages. So I made a conscious choice to use standard ML because um, fantastic as Haskell is, um, there's a lot of extra stuff in Haskell. The type system is very rich. There's a lot of stuff that allows you to, you know, like monad comprehensions that allow you to do algebraic operations that makes the language just simply intimidating. And so, you know, I think over time, Morel may, may absorb some of the features from Haskell, but my goal was to produce something that was uh, really concise. Like a SQL program, you very, very, very rarely see types mentioned in a SQL program. Um, you know, the type inference system, uh, standard ML's type system is simple enough that uh, you very rarely need type annotations, and that was, that was kind of what I was going for here. As for whether, you know, standard ML is a eager functional language, Haskell is a lazy language, I haven't actually decided yet whether um, Morel is eager or lazy. Um, so I'm being meta-lazy in making that decision. <laughs> Um, so, um, and also Morel is a, it's a language, it's a very young language, it is still evolving. Part of the reason I'm here is to say, come work with me on this, start bringing your use cases, let's shape the language. Um, uh, so nothing is set in stone, you know, the, the key idea is, I've explained to you already, and then where do we go with this? Um, I'm also an open source guy. I mean, Morel is developed open source, but my other work that I do on CalSite and so forth is open source. And I see the real benefits of developing this as a co collaborative community effort and kind of the wisdom of crowds approach. So um, please, uh, if you feel, feel the urge to help, please uh, get in touch. The target audience is SQL users, as I said, which implies certain kinds of simplicity in the language. Um, I'm de-emphasizing I think I've said the word monad once. Uh, I'm de-emphasizing those complex aspects that easily get pulled in when you're talking about functional languages. Um, I think they're all there, that the kind of the subtleties and nuances are there, but I'm trying not to, you know, talk about that up front. Um, it's been a very interesting exercise. Um, so my work, main work in Apache CalSite is to do with query optimization, traditional SQL query optimization. I think there's an awful lot that the compiler, the, the programming language compiler community can learn from the query optimization com community and vice versa. And this is a really good test, test bed to see how those approaches fit together. Um, and a very interesting thing that comes up is what I call functional programming in the small versus in the large. So, by in the small, I mean you're writing this particular function and you're worried about tail recursion or memory management or, or whatever. Functional programming in the large, which was introduced in this MapReduce paper, is the idea of using functional programming languages as a way of plugging together components. And you're not so much worried about what's being allocated on the heap as does the whole system compose in a, in a manageable way. Quick intro to standard ML. Um, if you know Haskell and so forth, this probably will be very straightforward. Um, standard ML and Morel have a read eval print loop, which means this text as it appears on the screen, the hyphen is the prompt, hello world is the expression, and then what's below it is what the system prints. And so it's a nice easy way to, you know. Um, so 
We're looking at Hello World, which is a string. One plus two are working on integers. We've also got reals, uh, lists, um, lists with polymorphism, so you can have a list of any type variable. Um, functions are a built-in type, you know, uh, you know lambdas. Um, standard ML uses fn, where Haskell would use backslash. Um, you can have tuples, which are basically like anonymous records. Um, so uh, one comma a is a tuple of type in time string. Um, and then you've got records with named fields. The record type is uh, actually one of the key reasons I went for ML, because uh, Haskell, or at least most variants of Haskell, don't have uh, support for record types built in, as I understand. Um, so you define variables, val x equals one. It's not really a variable because when you, it, its, its value is set forever. You can't reassign x, um, but there's no better word f f in the programming language community besides variables. Um, val is odd. Here I'm defining a value um, whose value is a lambda, so it's exactly the same as the line below it where I use the fun keyword to define a function. So fun is just syntactic sugar for defining a value whose value is a lambda. And then I'm applying this is odd function to x and it says yes, one is, 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 uh, uh, is odd. And then lastly, the let construct, which allows me to define some temporary values and then evaluate an expression. Um, ML has uh, algebraic data types defined using data type, which you can think of as a uh, tagged union or something like that. Um, so I can say a tree has three different subtypes, empty, leaf, and node. Um, this is polymorphic, meaning it's a tree of any data type that you want. Um, in this, I'm going to instantiate it here with ints, and so each of those words becomes a constructor. So like leaf seven, reading from the right, creates a int tree with one element in it. And so the whole expression there will create a tree with five elements in it. Um, and uh, with a algebraic data type, it's very natural to write a case statement to basically exhaustively, you know, you've got three branches in that case statement. You can handle empty, leaf, and node. Um, and uh, you can easily prove that you've covered all of the cases. And one interesting thing about case is when I write node um, I, L, R, I'm actually declaring those variables at that point. I, I'm declaring variables and assigning them at the same time as I'm pattern matching. So those are actually the declarations of those variables. So case not only matches patterns, but it kind of deconstructs objects as it's, as it's going. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so the fun is also, you know, you could, there's a variant of fun which is shorthand for case where you can define the function with, you know, many different uh, forms and case will, it'll automatically generate a case that, that uh, uh, dispatches to the right version of it. Um, so in ML, the relations, I use the word relation and li list interchangeably. I know they're technically different. Um, ML has higher order functions, so a function like filter, which takes a list and a, a function that returns a Boolean and will return a subset of that list um, where the, that function evaluates to true. So a higher order function is something that takes a function as an argument or perhaps returns a function as a result. So filter and map are built into ML in many functional languages. Um, and a lot of people have noticed that this is equivalent to SQL. So the where clause in SQL has a very similar effect to the filter clause. And um, this is uh, kind of not an accident. Um, it's just that in order to write that in ML, I have to write list.filter and this complicated looking lambda expression. Um, if I want to do joins, so Here's a join expression in the, in the SQL, joining emps and depths with their, where they have, have the same department number. It now turns into seven lines of ML, list, dot, map, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> if you read it from the inside, you see you, you're um, 
uh, reading from uh, the, the EMPS uh, relation, then you're using flat map to read from the department's, uh, all, of the, all of the department records, and then you're applying a filter to filter out the ones that are not the same. So uh, we're doing relational programming here, but it's very verbose and it's upside down. Um, so in Morel, I aim to make those kinds of operations first class. So um, since Morel is a superset of standard ML, this program is valid Morel as well. Um, but I added a new expression to um, Morel that isn't in standard ML, which is this from expression. And it has subclauses where and yield. So from I'm saying, you can think of it like a for each loop in, in a, you know, in Java or whatever. Um, so it, it is going through the EMPS collection and it is successively binding E to each, each, each record in the EMPS collection. And then for each EMP, it's going through the DEPS collection and binding D. So it's doing a, you know, nested loop here. And then applying where, um, filtering the things out. So you can think of this as doing nested loops, or you can think of it as a pipeline of relational operations. You, it doesn't really matter what it is. It, how, how it does this is an implementation detail. Um, and then lastly, um, I added some syntactic sugar to Morel so you didn't have to use this pound depth no, this, this accessor function for finding a particular field. Um, so I allowed you to write e dot no to access the depth no field of the e record. So this starts to begin an awful lot, look an awful lot like SQL. The select clause is the first thing in SQL and it's the last thing in, uh, in morale. And I think everyone acknowledges that's the way SQL should have been in the first place. Uh, uh, other than that, and the fact that I choose lowercase keywords because I don't want this to look like COBOL, um, uh, there we are. So let's go back to word count. I promised we'd come back. So this is the full working word count uh, solution. So I was able to use a let clause to define a temporary function called split. Um, and I'm, I'm building this, you know, from the, from the primitives. So um, I am, uh, let me see. Yeah, so I'm using the string.str built-in function um, <clears throat> that uh, explodes a string into its constituent characters. Um, and then the, I'm able to define a split function um, I'm sorry, string explode is the thing that converts a string into characters. So now I've defined this split function from first principles, I can then use it, um, and this thing now looks an awful lot like a, a SQL query. So, yeah, and here it is running, um, it works. Um, so this is where this distinction between programming in the small and programming in the large comes in. So. Programming in the small is this, you know, you're working in individual characters and, uh, you know, you're writing recursive functions and so forth. Um, it's good to have that in your back pocket, um, but most of us are not implementing quicksort and regular expressions. We're just using libraries for that. And so we hope that it's built into the language, but we have this ability to write, you know, low level, low level code if we want to. Um, and then I call this pro functional programming in the large. Um, so the contribution of Morel is to put those both kinds of programming in the same, in the same language, um, which gives the opportunities for the optimizer or the yeah, compiler, whatever, um, to kind of see, see the, 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 the whole problem from beginning to end. But you still want to use this for programming in the large, and so you'd still like to be able to, you'd like to be able to define this function once um, and then run this large-scale program on 100 compute nodes. And Morel makes it possible to do that. Um, let's just drill into some more, more of the features here. Um, so um, when you define a function in Morel, um, so here's a function called EMPS2, uh, which runs a query or a from expression. Um, the from expression returns a bunch of records, and in fact, one of the fields in the record, this comp field, is actually a lambda. 
So emps2 is a function that returns a relation that contains a function. Um, and that's what I mean about functions being first class objects. You certainly couldn't dream of doing this in SQL, right? You, you're, you can have, I guess you can have uh, like uh, points and geo, geologic, uh, geographical regions and spatial data inside your SQL data set, and I guess you can have XML documents. But I've not seen a variety of SQL where you can actually has, have a function as a value in your relation. But you know, why not, right? It's 2021. Um, so, uh, so that's this idea of making functions as values, you know, pervasive throughout the language. The other thing about this is a, um, a, a functional language compiler will take this this function, and if I use emps2, um, it will, or in fact, if I use comp as well, it will try and inline it. It'll say, it'll say do I have a definition of emps2, which is going to be the same every time I call this? In which case, I'll inline this thing. Um, so it will cease to be a function call anymore. Um, and that gives the opportunity for some significant uh, optimizations. It turns out that kind of expansion is exactly what every relational database has been doing since 1980, which is called view expansion. If you define a view, it doesn't evaluate the view and get the records and pass it on to the rest of the statement. It expands the view the same way a C compiler would expand a macro. So. Um, there's an example of functional languages and query optimizers kind of doing the same thing, just giving different names for it. Um, and yeah, there it is, it works. So, uh, so in this particular query, I've decided to call comp with um, passing it the value 1,000. So this, probably the compiler can, can inline this because it knows that comp always has the same definition. So um, there's various clauses of the from statement, um, each of which represents a particular relational operator, and we can chain them together. So here's a rather contrived example where we um, uh, read employees, and then we sort them, and then we apply a where clause. Um, sorry, then we, then we compute some additional stuff. You know, we compute the, uh, the name length field, then we apply a filter where name length is greater than four. Uh, we uh, aggregate using the group construct and compute a couple of aggregate functions. And then we apply another filter and then we finally project the results. So in SQL you can't have, the, you've got to limit, you know, the six possible clauses in a select statement and generally you can only use three or four of them. In this case, in Morel, you can basically ch continue changing these as long as you want to. Um, so let me just take this step by step. And you know, initially, we've got the fields, department number, ID, and name. And then after we apply the order operator, the results change, the, the, the order of the results change, but we've still got the same fields. When we apply the yield expression, we've got an extra field available. The name length field becomes available. So as you can see, each step in a Morel um, from statement is basically making more a different set of variables available. Um, and so, you know, when I'm applying this where clause, we can use the name length field, which was, which was available previously. Um, the group expression radically changes the, the, the because, because we're folding together multiple records, um, the individual fields of those records, unless they're in the group clause, those individual fields, like the name, for example, is no longer visible after the group. Um, but, uh, and then we can also compute some aggregate functions. In this case, we're counting the number of fields and records in the group and summing the name length. So this stuff composes really nicely. Um, just a comparison, uh, the, 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 there's the Morel program. Uh, the SQL is of a similar length, but you can see the nesting is extremely complicated and you have to read it inside out again. Um, you can think of this, as I said, as a, as a for loop in a procedural language like Java, where you start off the outermost loop is the for, uh, uh, you know, iterating over the emps relation. Uh, it gets complicated very quickly, but if you want to, you can think of it as you know, binding, you know, the, the name and name length and ID fields, and then doing some stuff inside the loop. So now CalCite. 
Um, uh, Apache Calcite is the project I founded um, about 10 years ago. It's an Apache project. Um, uh, Calcite is an implementation of relational algebra. Um, and you'll see in a minute why we, why we decided to bring Calcite into Morale. Um, Calcite is a toolkit for building a database management system. It's used, for example, it's the query optimizer inside Hive. Um, uh, it also powers uh, Apache Beam and the SQL implementation of Beam. Um, and it is designed not so much as a product, more as a toolkit. So naturally, a lot of pieces of it are pluggable. Um, a particular interest is that the, um, the rewrite rules that power the query optimizer are pluggable as well. We've got about 200 built-in rules, but people add new rules all the time. Um, I should call them transformation rules. Um, and uh, many parts of it are optional, but the relational algebra is really the core of it, the, the orange ellipse there. Um, so quick intro to relational algebra for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, this is how Calcite would take a query, a select query, a reasonably complex one, and you kind of read from the bottom up. So the first thing it does is it scans the employees and departments tables, applies, uh, uh, runs them through the join operator, and then runs that, the results of that through the filter operator and then the aggregate operator. So the, you can see there's a lot of parallels with the, the morale from statement there. Um, the way Calcite works, the big contribution Calcite makes is well, it has an implementation of relational algebra, but it has rewrite rules. So if you take a look at the filter and the join over there, what we're doing is we're joining the employees and departments together, and then we're throwing away all employees who are um, younger than 50. Um, we can do that earlier on, right? We, we, we know that we can throw away the employees under the age of 50 before we do the join, which means the join has less work to do. So you represent that as a rewrite rule, the, we, we call it push filter through join rule, that can basically transpose those. That's an algebraically valid operation because it is always, you know, before and after that transformation will always produce the same results. So a query optimizer um, works based on, uh, by having lots of these rewrite rules and applying them um, using dynamic programming guided by cost. And the rewrite rules are, the cool thing about them is they're independent of each other. So each rule works, does the right thing in isolation, and when you compose them and you put 200 of them in a bucket and apply them all to the same query, they don't interfere with each other. They're still individually valid and therefore the whole thing is valid. You add a cost model and an engine that does dynamic programming and that's how query optimizers are built. So we brought in Apache Calcite into Morel. Um, and the first thing we needed was the fact that when, um, when you set up a Calcite system, you kind of um, mount these external data sources um, so that they look like, in Calcite's parlance, they look like schemas. They look like foreign database connections. When we introduced this into Morel, we actually made them just look like um, objects. So Food Mart in Morale, if you, if you, if you launch Morale and it's backed by Calcite, um, the fact that Food Mart is a schema in Calcite means there will be a top level value called Food Mart in Morale, and its value is a record. And the, the fields of that record are the names of the tables that are inside that particular database. So um, if I write scott.emp, um, Scott is the database depth is a particular relation in it, and therefore, scott.dept has four rows. So, of course, this is not really in memory in morale, it's, but I can still write queries on it. Um, and as far as the morale language is concerned, it doesn't care whether it's external or internal. So I can write this expression from D in scott.dept where not exists, and you can kind of see it maps directly to a SQL statement um, but the, as far as Morel's semantics are concerned, it might as well just be a set of you know, records in a list. Um, so if we set hybrid to true, this tells the Morel compiler to consider implementations of this 
that use calcite relational algebra and uh, tries, to, tries to generate a plan using relational algebra. And so this is what will come out as the plan. So this is, this is a calcite plan. Calcite, all of these things, it's a logical project on top of a logical filter. So calcite hasn't decided how it's going to execute this yet. Calcite might decide to generate a Spark program to execute it. Um, but uh, you know, this is the starting point for Calcite to do what it does. So the optimization is this, I mentioned this, this interesting kind of um, collision of the two different systems. So relational query optimization applies to the relational operators um, and you have transformation rules that match particular operators and there's, there's probably about 10 core operators. I showed you earlier the one that matches a filter on top of a join. There's another one that matches a filter on top of a project and so forth. So the transformation rules match those patterns and re basically reorder the relational operators. Um, and it makes decisions based on statistics, if it has statistics. And relational query optimization is incredibly good at like whole program optimization. I mean, pushing a filter through a join or converting a, pushing a, union into a join or something can result in the program running a hundred times or a thousand times or a million times faster. These, these are kind of everyday results from query optimizers. Functional programming optimization are, they're often um, much more s smaller benefits, um, uh, but you know, definitely affect things like the amount of memory that's allocated, uh, the size of the, the, the stack um, and so forth. So it's just been interesting. I can't kind of go into all of the details, but it's been interesting finding out optimizations that exist in both places that have you know, different names, um, and then optimizations that are kind of genuinely new. Um, the big picture, um, why am I doing this? I think the, the, so the word count example is, it's interesting because it has, um, uh, it's a convergence of programming in the small and, and, and programming in the large. Um, uh, the, the goal of WordCamp was to introduce this new compute model, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the MapReduce compute model and the idea of a, of a distributed system running little fragments of user code um, in a massively parallel system. So, um, Neither of the, these are two kind of the two existing compute models that, that existed, let's say, 20 years ago. You've got the functional programming model that allows you to write kind of cute recursive functions and stuff, a factorial function and, and all the rest. Um, and then um, you've got the, you know, query systems like the SQL systems that allow you to do large computations, but it's not Turing complete. You can't do general purpose programming. So, um, the MapReduce and uh, work basically took the functional paradigm into data parallel systems, um, and the SQL community that I was a part of at the time, we took it as a great threat that people were doing our, our kind of problems, solving them in a, 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 you know, a functional programming way. Um, there's been relational programming in the functional language community with things like list comprehensions and monad comprehensions in, in languages like Haskell, um, that you can kind of see the relationship. But the, the, the problem with that is that those looked alien to people that were writing SQL queries. So, um, well, they, they look kind of similar, but there were very few SQL programmers that were prepared to cross over to Haskell. Plus, it didn't run on a distributed system. So what we've tried to do in Morel is kind of create these links, more of an explicit link between the good things of the query system, which is query optimizers and so forth, and the ability to run on you know, large parallel systems, uh, integrate that more closely with the, the functional programming language type system and, and, and so forth. So I see Morel as this opportunity to unify um, the, all of these various ideas. Um, and I encourage you to try it out and uh, come and work with me. So in summary, Morel is a functional query language. Um, it has a rich type system inherited from its uh, functional programming uh, parentage. Um, it's as concise as SQL, um, but it is also Turing complete. It's a general purpose language. 
Um, it combines relational query optimization and uh, Lambda uh, functional programming optimization techniques. Um, it it's natively executes in a Java interpreter, but it can generate programs for uh, data parallel engines. So I don't think we have time for questions here, um, but I'll be outside the door and we'll happily chat for many, many hours as long as you guys want to talk. So. Yeah.